Hi, I'm Anoush. I'm Freddie. I'm Chris. And on today's New Statesman podcast, we discuss the prospect of a fresh Scottish independence referendum. And then you ask us, has Keir Starmer dropped Labour's most appealing policies by rejecting Corbynism? So for the first half, I'm delighted to be joined by our Scotland editor, Chris Deeran, to discuss Nicola Sturgeon's latest gambit. Earlier this week, she outlined plans to hold a so-called consultative independence referendum on the 19th of October next year, or if that's not deemed legal by the Supreme Court, then framing the 2024 general election or whenever the next general election may be as a de facto vote on Scottish independence. So Chris, this comes off the back of uh, Sturgeon's sort of relaunching the referendum campaign by releasing a new paper on the case for independence last month. And at the time, you wrote a piece with a very funny intro that I do encourage all our listeners to read if they haven't read it already, outlining how the phrase independence referendum has carved a groove in your mouth after 25 years of covering Scottish politics. I mean, is this same old, same old from Sturgeon or should we sort of sit up and take notice this time? I think it is same old, same old in some respects, but there are some differences to it. I uh, I guess the, the issue was that the independence debate was stuck and it has been stuck for a long time. The polls have shown that roughly half the population is in favour and roughly half the population is against. The SNP keep winning elections by enormous margins, um, but uh, not really getting any closer to, to their goal of a, a referendum and then a, a vote for independence. And I think Sturgeon, you know, she's been First Minister for a while now. The SNP have been in government for 15 years the window is probably beginning to close on the likelihood of certainly them increasing their vote on uh, their presence at the next elections, which would you know maybe uh, make it easier for them to call a referendum. And so I think she felt she had to do something. She had to take an action that ungum the process, if you like, and almost do something and then sit back and see what happens. And that she did a number of things, actually, uh, some of which I, I was more impressed by than than others, but she certainly has ungummed the process. Now, of course, it's, it is the same old, same old in that we still are talking about independence and we still aren't really much closer to it or deciding that we don't want it. But uh, at least the, 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 the conversation, which had become very, very stale, has begun to move on a bit. Right. Okay. Because you do say you do sort of allude to the political motivations for this latest bid for independence in your piece, um, where you write it's driven more by muscle memory and the need for internal husbandry than desire or a genuine belief that the prize is in sight, which is lovely phrasing. And of course, keeping the troops and the party faithful happy is an important part of party politics. So how is it going down within the SNP and among the sort of general yes campaign circles? I think it's gone down really well. There was growing frustration, certainly amongst the more rabid pro-independence campaigners, there wasn't more of a movement towards towards the referendum, maybe the sense that the SNP had settled into running the devolved government and were quite enjoying themselves and had maybe put uh, independence on the back burner, you know, the, the polls weren't changing. So, so you know, what, what was it all about, really? The SNP exists to bring independence and the rest of it was very much a, a sideshow. And so the fact that she came out, we had the first report a couple of weeks ago, which compared the UK's performance in various economic metrics to those of smaller countries that would perhaps resemble an independent Scotland more closely. Unsurprisingly, it found that all of those smaller countries performed much, much better than the UK at absolutely everything, which uh, well, it would, wouldn't it? Of course. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and then, of course, she comes out this week with uh, her big plan to get the referendum going. And, you know, there's been a lot of pent up energy amongst yes campaigners to just get going at this and so uh, you know the people i've spoken to i've seen social media etc suggest that they are pleased that you know that the march has begun again i mean if we're not trying to be too cynical about it and thinking that it's just political is there any basis in there being an increased support for independence i mean there is a majority for independence in holyrood made up of smp and green msps and they do have more votes and seats than they had in 2011 so does that mean there is actually an increased mandate so there is a sort of argument for for bringing this back yeah i think from their perspective that's absolutely true i think you have to separate two things here the, the first thing is that parties that uh, want an independent scotland have a majority of seats in the scottish parliament and you have the smp and the green seats together so they would argue that with that, that entitles them to a referendum and the British government should listen to that and, uh, you know, observe democracy and, and the will of the people of Scotland and allow them to have one. The other side of it, though, is that 
support for independence hasn't shifted in an awfully long time. You know, it's still below 50 percent despite Brexit, despite Boris Johnson, uh, despite, you know, Sturgeon's relatively impressive performance during COVID. And also that the uh, polls show that there isn't really a desire for an independence referendum at the moment. There's still something like two thirds of people don't want a referendum on the SNP's timescale now October the 19th next year. Um, the, I think the, you know, the majority or the, the largest individual share that have a preference is that it, it's maybe three years away, um, which either means they do want one in three years or they just quite like having it three years down the line as a sort of emergency break glass security. So you, you do have this thing where the SNP and the Greens are winning the majority of seats, but then when you look at the polls, it suggests that that doesn't necessarily mean that people want a referendum next year. And I think probably that difference is what allows the British government to say there isn't actually all that much of an appetite for a, a referendum anytime soon. Uh, and it kind of undercuts Sturgeon's argument that, you know, that, that there should be one. So it allows both sides, in a sense, to take the positions they were going to take anyway and just sort of go on shouting at each other and, and nothing very much changing. Right. OK, so in the, in the way that you write, sort of you, that you can pick the right statistics, you can also pick the right polling for whichever side of the argument you're, yeah, you're yeah, on. I, I, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Right, OK. And of course, the Scottish government doesn't have the power itself to legislate for a referendum. And the UK government at the moment isn't conceding one. It's saying it's not the right time. So how likely is it and sort of what is the mechanism that Sturgeon might be able to secure sort of the legal backing that she needs for, for holding one? How would it work? How would that? I think that's the sort of her first route to a referendum that she's trying. So this was probably the cleverest part of her statement on Tuesday this week. Well, one, she announced the date, her preferred date for the referendum, October the 19th next year. Second, she announced that she'd asked the Lord Advocate, who's Scotland's senior law officer, to refer the case of whether Holyrood has the power to call a consultative referendum to the Supreme Court. This was always going to end up in the Supreme Court anyway. I think the expectation was that the SNP and the Greens would push ahead and try and hold the referendum and then it would be referred to the Supreme Court either by the British government or by, you know, it might have been just a disgruntled citizen, you know, a, a sort of a, a, a Tory or a, a unionist supporter who, who just referred the whole thing to, to the court. So uh, in what struck me as a bit of almost salmon desk suppleness, she, she caught everyone by surprise by announcing the Lord Advocate had already referred the, the, the case to the Supreme Court. Now, the Supreme Court has said, OK, we've got that now. It doesn't necessarily mean they will rule on this because at the moment it's only a hypothetical situation because the, the uh, Referendum Act hasn't actually gone through the Scottish Parliament. And until it's gone through the Scottish Parliament, has been voted on and, and uh, agreed, then in a sense you're asking the Supreme Court to rule on something that doesn't properly exist. And there has been a suggestion from legal people who know much more about these things than I do, that, that the Supreme Court doesn't particularly like ruling in those situations. So I think the first thing is we'll have to hear whether they are willing to go ahead and, and make a ruling or not. And then after that, if the decision is that they will make a ruling, they will come to some decision on whether there should be a referendum or whether the Parliament has the powers to call a referendum. The expectation, again, amongst those with legal knowledge is that they're less likely to say that 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 is possible. They're more likely to suggest that that control sits with the UK government. And that's why Sturgeon said that if that happens, she will go into the next general election on a single policy, campaigning for a single policy, which will be independence for Scotland. And that was the real surprise in, in what she did on, on Tuesday. You know, it's a pretty major step in a number of of ways. And, you know, I think, I think that's the thing that certainly up here we've been talking about as something that could either go well or it could backfire quite spectacularly on her. Yes, well, that, well, that's what came to mind when I heard about that sort of second, that's sort of like plan B of her strategy, isn't it? It is really interesting because in my experience of covering elections, and I've covered far fewer than you have, I'm sure, but voters don't usually take to being told what they should be voting on, do they? You know, everyone says sort of this is this is a Brexit election or this is a, an austerity election and then it just doesn't really turn out that way. So, you know, what what necessarily makes Sturgeon so confident that the next general election people will be voting on Scottish independence, not least because of the economic circumstances that people find themselves in at the moment. The context is completely different. Exactly right. And although we've had you know, politicians saying this is a Brexit election or, or whatever before. And Sturgeon gave the impression that the SNP would literally have one policy. You know, it would be the, the smallest manifesto in the history of politics. It will just say the SNP wants an independent Scotland. If you agree, 
vote for us. So, you know, the potential for the shortest suicide note in history if it all goes badly <laughs> wrong. But, 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 but I agree. I, I think that's the, the unknown. There is so much else to talk about at the moment. You know, in the, in the last election, the SNP went into it with a manifesto promising all sorts of things, you know, devolution of drugs policy, employment law, immigration powers, fair pensions, and end to the two-child cap and tax. It was a very traditional manifesto they went, they went in with it. And although people voted for the SNP in, in, in large numbers, you know, they, they weren't necessarily voting for independence. They were voting for a party that traditionally been seen to stand up for Scotland at Westminster, which is obviously a, a different thing. Now, what Sturgeon's saying is that if you vote for us, you will be voting for us to open negotiations for Scotland to leave the UK. And this is actually an old SNP policy. Before Holyrood existed, there was a, a sort of acceptance that a majority of votes for the SNP would mean the SNP would begin those negotiations to leave. But obviously, since Holyrood... There have been other routes to that, probably you know fairer and, and more sensible routes to that. But I think on Sturgeon's side, there is, you know, where I have some sympathy for her is is uh, Kieran Martin, the uh, who formerly worked in the cabinet office and worked on the arrangements for the 2014 referendum. He's since come out as an academic and said that the, the problem is that if you say that a majority in the Scottish Parliament of MSPs who are in favour of independence is not a route to a next referendum then you're almost, in effect, saying there is no route to a second referendum, that there is no democratic route to a second referendum. And the union at that point moves from being a, a, you know, a voluntary union to something that's more like Scotland being kept there, as, as Sturgeon said, you know, imprisoned by a, a prime minister. Now, you know, I wouldn't necessarily put it that way, but I think you can see the case. We probably missed a trick in 2014 on the aftermath of not setting up arrangements that would set out quite clearly what, what, what the conditions would be for us, another referendum, you know, the, the timing of it, the, the maths behind it, that sort of thing. I mean, that's, that's gone now, you know, so the, the chance to have an ordered procession is now much more like wacky races when you, you go into it. It's just everyone running, screaming, pushing each other, throwing bombs at each other and the rest of it. And, and, and that really, I think, is where we are with the Sturgeon's general election proposal. You raised the point about voters, and I think that is a big issue for the SNP because... Judging how the Scottish electorate will respond to this is, is quite hard to do. But, you know, in my experience, people don't like being told, you will vote for us and we will have this one policy. So if you vote for us, it will mean we begin moving towards independence, especially, again, as you said, and there was a huge cost of living crisis and all the associated challenges as the ongoing hangover for COVID. You know, Sturgeon's priorities might not necessarily be the voters' priorities. And I suppose... There's the issue of whether her approach will irritate some voters and attract others. Sturgeon's counting on those being attracted, outnumbering those being irritated. But, but you, know, you can't treat voters like they're sheep to be chased into a particular pen. And I think that's the real risk that she's running. You know, it's a big gamble that voters won't feel maybe a bit patronised, maybe denied a genuine, broad democratic choice. Maybe just think that, you know, we have so many priorities and challenges just now, we need a more general and uh, traditional offer from parties that want to be in government or want to certainly represent Scottish seats at Westminster. Mm, and I suppose in that case, it sort of hands an opportunity to Labour, doesn't it? I mean, hearing you list some of the SNP's policies in their last manifesto, you can kind of imagine Labour calling for those sort of more traditional kind of centre-left offers. And if, if the SNP aren't offering those and are campaigning on that one single issue, then it does give Anasawa and, and also the the sort of you know national party an opportunity but it is also it it could also be an opportunity for the conservatives as well you know could they replay their 2015 general election trick of saying a vote for labor is a vote for the SNP and 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 eventually an independent scotland which is you know what a line that they used very effectively in 2015 and obviously with this all of this chatter particularly in england about labor pacts with other parties and how they might come in in a sort of center left alliance that is a particular vulnerability, I think, for the Labour Party as well. So, so what do you make of what this means for, for Labour's chances? Well, I think the Conservatives will certainly try that approach because it was so successful for them previously when they had Salmond and Ed Miliband's pocket, or was it the other way around? I can't remember. But, but um, <laughs> I, think, I think it's really important that Labour in advance rule out any prospect of A, any kind of formal arrangement with the SNP, and B, that they will agree to a referendum. If they don't want to grant the SNP one, certainly, and I know the Scottish Party feel very much that they shouldn't, um, they have to say that there will be no referendum regardless of the situation. I'd almost challenge the SNP to to vote a Labour government down if it is indeed a minority government. It seems to be the favourite sort of outcome at the moment. I suppose Sturgeon will also be looking at 
you know, if she gets this majority in, in favour of the SNP, there's no actual guarantee that a British government would then have to say, OK, we will begin negotiations for a, an independent Scotland. In fact, I don't think there's any possibility of that. Just because the SNP say that's what the outcome would be doesn't mean the, the, the unionist parties and the British government needs to accept that. I suppose what it might do, though, is put increased pressure on a minority Labour government to consider whether they actually have to grant a referendum. That, and that might be what's in the back of Sturgeon's mind rather than, you know, you, you, you promise much more and then negotiate backwards from from there. But certainly in terms of where this leaves Labour in Scotland, you know, they, they are on the way back to a greater or lesser extent. You know, they've, they've gone up in the polls. Anna Sarwar is, is popular. The idea of a Labour government at Westminster is appealing to some, you know, and, and the sense that a, a Labour government at Westminster is something that traditionally Scots have wanted, majority mm. of Scots have wanted, and that that may begin to let the air out of the nationalist balloon were it to happen. And that's what I meant, I guess, at the start when I was talking about the window closing a little bit on on the chance for the SNP to have their referendum, because if Labour do win power at Westminster, then I think, you know, those on the centre-left, many of whom are convinced by independence and will stick with that anyway, but there will be others who are probably more open-minded about having a centre-left government at Westminster that would perhaps take the sting out of remaining in the UK and, and it may affect how they cast their, their votes. So Labour will be doing everything they can to make Sturgeon look like an extremist, to point out just the oddity of going into an election campaign with one policy to say that, you know, she's trying to press gang Scots to voting for something that actually most of them don't want at the moment. And and that may turn out to be, you know, a clever thing for them to do. They may they may get votes on the back of that. But equally, you know, the SNP have been winning elections and winning big for a long time now. So you you wouldn't, I guess presume that they don't know what they're doing here. It is just, it's just an odd one, isn't it, to, uh, to go into an election on one policy and um, expect everyone to fall in line behind you. Yeah, very true. And just lastly, Chris, what about the Tory side? I mean, the language from the Conservatives in Westminster, I mean, I think, I don't know whether you agree, has been quite careful on this. They, they don't say sort of never, never, ever again. They say now isn't the right time for a referendum. You know, there's so much else going on. Scottish Secretary Alistair Jack was saying UK government would consider any request for a Section 30 order and it's quite conciliatory in his language. Is this on purpose? Because if there's too strong a Tory pushback, that could result in a backlash that could potentially further further support for independence. I mean, after all, Boris Johnson has been sort of a central kind of campaigning boon for, for Nicola Sturgeon for a while. Yeah, and, and even Boris Johnson, I think, when he was quoted overseas, uh, I think this was before Sturgeon made an announcement, but he said, you know, we'll have a look at it. Yeah. Um, so he was conciliatory as well. I don't think in their minds they're conciliatory in the slightest. I think that's very much for public consumption. But, you know, the Tories are in pretty dire straits, obviously up here, but but also at, at Westminster. And I think they're aware, the council elections recently in Scotland, where they went from second into third place in Labour, leapfrogged them. And I think they're aware that Probably the moment that began with Ruth Davidson coming in and with her very strong personality that attracted a lot of a whole lot of votes. That, that Douglas Ross, who is now the Tory leader in Scotland, doesn't really have that pizzazz, isn't really attracting people. He screwed up a bit when he called on Boris Johnson to go, and then said actually Boris Johnson needs to stay because of the Ukraine war, and then came out again and said actually Boris Johnson needs to go again. He sort of flip flopped around on this, and I think that's undermined his credibility quite significantly. And they're, they're just aware, I think, that Labour are on something of the way back and the Tories are dropping down as they go. So Labour become almost the unionist choice. And, and that was the thing that kept the Tories up with the well, the unionists were, were voting for them. So, I, yeah, I, I think the conciliatory approach to things is very much informed by that. And also, of course, by the fact that if there were to be a referendum, you have to win it. And if, if you just tell Scots that they don't know what they're doing and they're all stupid, and even that the SNP are ridiculous. People in Scotland don't necessarily, they might all vote for the SNP, but they are the party of government. They've been running the country for a while. So, you know, they have a credibility up here. And unless you're a real hardline unionist, I think, the, you know, the way you talk about Scotland and Scottish politics is, is quite important, the tone that you take. And I would say also that the British government has kind of changed the way it's been in Scotland. There was a lot of talk of, you know, muscular unionism, of slapping a union jack on <laughs> new bridges and new roads and the rest of it. And that's kind of fallen away as, as well. Again, it's a question of, of tone. You know, you go on and do the things you're going to do. People will notice, but, you know, if you're swaggering around the place, chances are that people in Scotland are not going to be particularly impressed by that. So there does feel like there's been that change as well. And we'll see how that lasts into a referendum campaign or a general election campaign or whatever when things get a lot, a lot spicier. I think maybe just on top of all that, there's a sense 
And it'll depend where you, you know, which way you would vote that the idea of going back into a referendum campaign and all the division that came in 2014 uh, of having that, those wounds reopened again is, is, you know, it's a bit worrying. It's a slightly exhausting thought. So I was speaking to friends who were yes voters as well, and, and they were sort of like, oh God, here we go again. You know, there is that feeling in people's minds that perhaps the, the, just the reality that 2014 wasn't all that long ago. It was quite dramatic. It was a huge political moment. And the idea that we have to go through all that again, especially when, as I said, the general mood seems to be that people aren't particularly ready for it yet, that, that may count against Sturgeon a bit as, again in the, the longer term. Yeah, I, me- I remember. I mean, really, that was the... That was the sort of kicking off point, wasn't it, of the kind of politics of division and Brexit, yeah. you know, trolling, politicians have to, having to have security, journalists having to have bodyguards, all, things all like of that. that. And I think if you were, you know, you speak to people and they had wildly different experiences of the referendum campaign, you know, some people on the yes side were having parties in George Square and concerts in Edinburgh and just having an absolutely great time, full of optimism, excited by the idea of a new country, fair play to them. But then there were those on the other side, as you know, I was at that point, who were getting you know, dogs abused quite a lot at the time. Posters getting ripped down, heard about people getting shouted down the street, or worse. I do remember after the referendum campaign was over and the votes were in, I almost felt like my shoulders almost just unclenching. I hadn't even realised I'd been so tense, but I had been. And I know I'm not alone in that as well. So, you know, there's a bit of me that just thinks, oh God, I really don't want to go through all that again. But, but, you know, it is what it is. Yeah. Okay, well, that's a good note to end on, I think. Thanks, Chris. And we'll obviously come back to this soon. Thanks so much for your time. And uh, I do encourage all our listeners to read Chris's excellent coverage. Hi, it's Anoush here. This is just a reminder that as a podcast listener, you have the option of subscribing to the New Statesman with a very special offer. You can subscribe for just a pound a week. That's 12 weeks for £12. If you go to newstatesman.com forward slash podcast offer. We'll be right back. From the New Statesman comes a new podcast, Audio Long Reads. The best of our reported features and essays, read aloud. Featuring writing from our authors, including Ian McEwan on wrestling with Orwell's Inside the Whale. Might we reasonably assume that there is no longer an inside to the whale? That the creature lies stranded on the beach, as whales sometimes are? That the guts and blubber and ribcage are on display? A Year Inside GB News with Stuart McGurk. At first, the problems weren't ideological, but practical, technical, and quite, well, obvious. And Maria Wilczek on Belarusian football fans who took on Alexander Lukashenko. After the August 2020 protests, hundreds of ultras were roughed up and held in custody. One was later found dead in suspicious circumstances. Ease into the weekend with our audio long reads, published every Saturday morning. Just search audio long reads from the New Statesman wherever you get your podcasts. Now it's time for a section we like to call You Ask Us. So thanks so much for joining us, Freddie, for You Ask Us. Our question uh, on this episode is from Tim. Thanks, Tim. He asks, has Keir Starmer, by ridding the Labour Party of all traces of Corbynism, robbed the party of many of its most appealing policies? So this question is really interesting. I think it must stem from comments that Keir Starmer made at the New Statesman's very own Politics Live event uh, when he was speaking to our future deputy political editor, Rachel Wearmouth, about his policies. So he actually told her what we've done with the last manifesto, and he was referring to the Labour 2019 manifesto is put it to one side we're starting from scratch the slate is wiped clean and on the pledge to scrap tuition fees which was in that manifesto and also in his own list of leadership pledges um starmer said we're going to have to look at that and he also refused to confirm whether he'd stick to the pledge to raise taxes on the top five percent of earners which was another part of his leadership campaign and we can listen to a bit of that here what we've done with the last manifesto is put it to one side Um, We're starting from scratch. Um, The slate is wiped clean. We've got a policy review going on at the moment. Annalisa Dodds is is leading that for us in consultation with our members and with our trade unions. Um, But I think nobody can pretend that um, the the world hasn't changed since 2019. We've been through a pandemic and out the other side of it. 
our um, you know, public services are on their knees. We've got um, an awful conflict in Ukraine, which I don't think is going to be resolved anytime soon, which means that um, economic sanctions are likely to be in place for some time. You know, a responsible Labour Party facing the electorate in a year or two's time, whenever it may be, has to take the world as it is um, and present our programme against that. And that's what we will do. So what do you think, Freddie? Is he throwing the baby out with the bathwater by scrapping or at least saying he's, he's going to look again at some of these Corbyn era policies? I think he's definitely trying to signal to voters that he's very different from Corbyn. The only thing I would say on that is that we don't yet know how radical Keir Starmer's Labour Party will be because they've not done the substantive policy announcements for the next general election. We're expecting those announcements to come out over the next six months to a year. So I think at that point we'll have a firmer grasp. I think it was interesting though that Starmer referenced the cost of living crisis almost as an excuse or an explanation for why some of those policies might have to change. And I think you're seeing this on both sides at the moment. The Tories are saying they can't do many of their spending commitments because of the hits public finances during the pandemic. And interestingly, Starmer said, OK, well, maybe we're going to have to look at our tuition fees policy because public finances have changed since 2019. So we're in this flux slightly, I think, and, and it will become clearer over the next few months. Yeah. You know, obviously, this is a major sore spot for those on the left of the party that he appears to be abandoning those pledges that he made during the leadership campaign, which were, you know, when you read those pledges now, a lot of them do not chime with the kind of things that he has come out with since then. So you have common ownership of energy companies. And I think he said that he wasn't sort of internationalising the um, the energy firms a while back, defending free movement as the UK leaves the EU. They've not really wanted to to talk about that at all. And they, and they haven't defended that. And sort of working shoulder to shoulder with trade unions, I suppose, would jar a bit with his initial sort of instinct to be quite equivocal about supporting the rail strikers. Yeah. But I would say, actually, I think that this is probably more of, uh, so far, a shift of tone rather than a shift of sort of substantive policy meet, because there are still quite a lot of policies that Labour says it has. And I know that they're, they're yet to set out their actual manifesto for the next general election. But so far, they do have quite a lot of policies from the Corbyn era, and also sort of quite radical new economic policies as well. So there's that £28 billion a year capital investment in the transition to green energy and green jobs, which, you know, Rachel Reeves only spoke to me about last week. So presumably that's still sort of part of their agenda. Scrapping universal credit, which was a Corbyn era policy, a rather mm -hmm. strange one because they didn't really have something that they would replace it with. So they went into I think they went into at least one election not having a welfare state, <laughs> which is quite funny. And then ending the VAT exemption for private schools. So, you know, that was also a Corbyn era yeah. idea to raise money, closing uh, this tax break loophole for private equity managers. That's something that, you know, is still in place, apparently, so as to fund sort of mental health provision that they want to unroll sort of across uh, sort of supporting the community and schools and things like that. So that's something that when I was speaking to Wes Streeting recently, he was telling me about and he was, you know, citing all of these, these policies as part of it. He actually used the phrase, he said, Labour's priority is to, fund better public services for the many by ending tax breaks for the privileged few. I mm. mean, that language obviously reflects the Corbyn motto. And then there's all of Angela Rayner's future of work pr proposals like flexible working by default, the right to switch off, workers having full employment rights from day one, scrapping zero hour contracts. And that includes strengthening trade unions. So mm. actually, Labour's call in that in that sort of package of measures is for government backed negotiations between unions and employers across entire sectors to set minimum pay rates and basic conditions. So you know, that, that all of that stuff they haven't they haven't sort of said that they won't do. Yeah. And it's things that shadow cabinet ministers have been speaking to me about very recently. So presumably that, that they don't count as part of the wiping the slate clean statement from Keir Starmer. Yeah, and Wes again confirmed that they were going to or at least try to implement a national care service on Tuesday. So as you say, there are quite radical policies that are still in play. I think your point about this being about tone is very important. Wes also kept using Blairite phrases on Tuesday, such as, you know, tough on the crime, tough on the causes of crime. So, And that's, that's interesting because Blair was so focused on image and trying to reassure the public that they weren't too radical, even if he was introducing exceptionally radical redistributive policies, for instance. So maybe they've learnt, learnt from Blair in that respect and there is a battle over the narrative. I think it's also interesting how the left of the party have uh, perceived Starmer's comments 
they were riled up. There was a, a sense, I thought, of resignation. It's, they've already bought this line. They'd, this is no surprise for them. I think they gave up on Starmer's radicalism a long time ago. I think when we look back to the leadership campaign, many in the party wanted Starmer to be that electable radical. They thought, let's keep Corbyn's policies, but let's give it to a guy in a suit. And they're disappointed with that. That's not to say that that won't come to fruition, as we've just been speaking about. The, some of the radical policies are there. Uh, we just have to wait and see. Electable radical is a really good way of putting it, because so far on paper, that is what I would say Keir Starmer is aiming to do. Maybe he will have a wholesale change of policy and we'll probably find out more towards conference season whether he is changing the policy direction. But so far, I think there is a lot of sort of inherited Corbynism, but with this shift in tone and emphasis. And that's not to say that, you know, that's not to give credence to Boris Johnson's thing of him being a Corbynite in a smart is Lington suit or whatever he, he calls him, because I do think there is a substantial difference in in Keir Starmer and Jeremy Corbyn's way of running the party and appealing to the electorate. I mean, what I remember from going round, I mean, even in the 2017 election, obviously, when Labour did better than expected, but still people, you know, people did like those individual policies. Mm -hmm. And then I think the person who sent the question in sort of called them appealing policies, and they were. Some of them polled quite well. Some of the policies about nationalising certain industries, for example, I remember going round Derby North, which was then the most marginal seat in the country in 2017, that Tories held by about 40 votes. And people were saying they quite liked these policies that Corbyn's Labour were putting forward, but they just didn't believe that he would be able, first, to get in power, but second, they didn't think that he had the competence to deliver them. I think that's quite important. That's something that sort of pollsters often say about that time, sort of people like the individual things, but they just didn't believe in the the man himself. Keir Starmer hasn't so far I don't think got that reputation no and it's it's interesting when you look at the politics of competence I think often it's a sleight of hand it's trust me this is the only reasonable policy solution that we can have at the moment as Cameron tried to portray austerity as Blair tried to portray lots of his agenda but really there's there's a imposition of values going on there and it's it's politics like any form of politics but you need to get the message Across well, the other thing I thought was very interesting from Starmer's comments was the emphasis on the stagnant economy, and I think he's learned from George Osborne in this respect, whereby you have to, or the mantra that you have to have a strong economy to have strong public services resonates with people. That's a growing theme for Labour at the moment. Starmer and other members of the um, shadow cabinet keep speaking about high or high taxes, low wages, low growth, and I think that might have some impact on voters having lived through the coalition years where the focus on long stable growth did actually influence lots of people's votes yeah no i've noticed them doing that too that's really interesting um well i suppose we'll keep an eye on the policies as they as they appear thanks so much for coming freddie thank you very much you've been listening to the new statesman podcast with me anusha kellyan and my colleagues chris dearin and freddie hayward We're produced by Mae Robson and our music is Devil with the Devil, licensed under Creative Commons. Thanks so much for listening and don't forget to subscribe and leave us a nice review. And if you want to send a question in to You Ask Us, you can email one to podcasts at newstatesman.co.uk. 